Welcome back to panel two of today's symposium. I think panel one was a wonderful beginning. Panel two has three speakers, so we are going to try to be a bit stricter about the time limits on the assumption that everybody could be speaking uh, for about 20 minutes. And if you go over, one of two things will happen. Either I will lean forward and say very gently something like, time, or a large black tarantula will come out of the ceiling and start crawling along the table, and I will begin to scream uncontrollably, and the whole event will be over. So we don't want to find out which of those will happen, so please keep to your time. Um, and then we will have plenty of time for discussion, both immediately afterwards and at the end of the day and during the break. So without more ado, I will introduce the panelists uh, for panel two, the state bashes back. And I am going to introduce them all at once in the order that they are listed on the program, which I assume will also be the order in which they are speaking. So our first speaker to my left will be Elizabeth Wood, who is professor of history at MIT and also currently the co-chair of the Graduate Consortium in Women's Studies. Her most recent book, and I should say that I am not reading everybody's CV, but their works that are most relevant or most recent for our purposes. Her most recent book is Performing Justice, Agitation Trials in Early Soviet Russia, uh, which came out in 2005. And I also just wanted to point to something that I discovered only this morning, which is that Elizabeth also has a really cool website on the Russian Revolution, um, a kind of scholarly and student website, which you can find uh, at web.mit.edu slash Russia1917. So I encourage you to check that out. Our second speaker is, and following in, in order after Elizabeth, um, is Laurie Essig, who is Associate Professor of Sociology and Women's and Gender Studies at uh, Middlebury College. Her first book, Queer in Russia, explored how sexual otherness was thought about in Soviet and post-Soviet Russia, a topic that she still works on and um, researches. She is also a very serious opinion journalist and blogger in venues including the Chronicle of Higher Education, where she just recently had a fabulous column on trigger warnings, which I urge you to check out. I actually think this is a question that's of real urgency and importance to uh, particularly to the women's and gender and sexuality studies community. Um, she also blogs uh, at Psychology Today and various other venues. Our third speaker, Jyoti Puri, is professor of sociology at Simmons College, just over the way there. Her most recent book, Encountering Nationalism, is that still accurate, Jyoti? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Encountering Nationalism, which came out in 2004, examines questions of nationalism and the state from a feminist sociological perspective. She also co-edited a special issue on transnational feminist sociology for the journal Gender and Society. She is currently working on a book called Sexuality Slash State, Decriminalizing Homosexuality in India, which I assume today's talk is from. So please join me in welcoming our distinguished panelists. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Okay, good. All right. Here we go. Um, the topic of today's talk is Vladimir Putin spectacle and anti-spectacle. And I'm very interested in the ways in which Putin has obviously created a uh, performance of masculinity. But then the protests of 2011 and 2012 create an anti-spectacle that is also about the performance of, of, of uh, masculinity, but an alternate masculinity, criticizing his masculinity, criticizing his hyper-masculinity. So I think this relates to the prior seminar panel, which was fantastic, um, about issues of hegemonic discourse, it, it, issues of sexual citizenship, issues of tolerance, intolerance, and particularly Putin's own intolerance. So let's 
start, I ha it, 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 this talk is a tricky one because I have to take for granted a lot of things that otherwise I would spell out, but in 20 minutes we'll see what I can do. Um, since August of 1999, Vladimir Putin and his team have been running an obviously well-orchestrated PR campaign to manage Putin's public appearance. This campaign, as I've argued in a number of um, works, has been based on the articulation of a number of different masculinities, and I think they can be actually disaggregated, and I'll allude to them today, that appear to give Putin both super political status, he's above politics, he's the heroic male who unifies Russia through his masculinity. It's a way of avoiding talking about class, race, um, and even sexuality, because he is the uh, top male, uh, and his masculinity uh, comes to show the strength of Russia, and that way you can avoid tensions over uh, what is what is uh, nationality in a multinational country. Russia is extremely complicated um, in terms of nationality, religion, um, and and also class. And um, so. He, this creates what I call a facade of autocracy, that he rules, he strengthens Russia, he'll hold Russia together. It also creates a facade of democracy because he's the popular man, he's the man of the street, he's the tough guy that uh, men at least, at least theoretically, can uh, recognize themselves. So, but what I want to talk about today is how that spectacle began to fall apart and be deeply questioned in the 2011-2012 protests. Um, the usual assumption among journalists and political scientists has been, was that the, those protests after the Duma elections of December 4th, 2011 were primarily about um, unfair elections. Um, and this, of course, is, is true. They were very much about elections and they were very much crafted about that. But what I want to argue is that um, what in many ways Russians were protesting was not, not just and even maybe not so much the unfair elections, as the phenomenon of Putin and Putinism, um, that they knew elections had been rigged already for a number of years, and at least the, the intellectual elites, and, and they accepted that because he was an acceptable president. But by the fall of 2011, it becomes unacceptable, and the unacceptability has to do with the excessive, uh, constant repetition of his masculinity. So if we think about it, um, that the, um, what we know about masculinity studies, right? It's masculinity as performance, that there are multiple masculinities, race, class, and gender really matter, and I'll show you why, that masculinities are relational, as Connell showed, with you know, hyper-masculinities, hyper alpha-masculinities, what does that do to beta-masculinities, and that also masculinity is repetitive. And I'm not gonna be able in the talk to think, talk about Crimea and what's happening today, but I think it's, uh, there's a way in which after the elections of 2012, Putin has tried to invent himself first as kind of the protector of the nation, and now I think he's gone back to an aggressive masculinity because masculinity, you, can't, you can't establish masculinity once it has to be constantly uh, demonstrated. The problem with Putin's uh, hyper-masculinity um, is that it, by 2011, what they were criticizing, oh, uh, back up a second. The other, the usual assumption is about protests is about uh, elections. And the second assumption is that usually, if it is about Putin, it's about Putin having too much power, that he's a dictator. And that's true. But what I want to address is the protests of Putin as a bad actor. And argue that the, pro the protests have been, were qu quintessentially a response to Putin's excessive reliance on a stereotyped, monochromatic, and excessive masculinity. I see that the main pieces of this hyper-masculinity that led to the protests were that it was demeaning to the intellectual, into intellectual classes and to the nation because it was too simplistic, that it was monochromatic and therefore boring, especially to the young people who came out on the streets and who were very vivid and uh, polychromatic in their uh, protests, and above all that it was insulting to men, um, many of the, uh, if I get to it, I'll show you, um, protest uh, signs that said, we are not sheep, uh, we are not, we don't want to be led around, and there are a lot of, um, unfortunately, uh, homophobic uh, sodomy jokes, which I'll also show you. Um, but the, above all, the problem has been his masculinity that belittles others, and this becomes um, intolerable. So I don't think I need to say much about the, can I do this just here? About <laughs> masculinity, right? You all recognize it. Um, it's, uh, 
it's been uh, omnipresent. Um, it changes over time, um, which I'm not going to try and do today, but um, that's important. And and then that the what the um, the uh, protests did was that the protests and the regime mirrored each other, and they strive to create the inverse of the other. As one um, of my favorite journalists said, the regime falsifies the vote, and internet users falsify the appearances of the authority. So it's obvious that this kind of photo, as soon as you start thinking about it, carefully staged, solo leader on horseback, um, the Marlboro Man, um, overtones of Teddy Roosevelt, another favorite masculine icon, if you think about Gail Betterman's work, if any of you know that amazing book. Um, the photos, uh, initially it was mostly a tough masculinity. These come out in 2007. The other key moment in the formation of that sort of masculine, uh, uh, virile, um, uh, non, uh, using virile to mean unaccessible to women, uh, came out in the um, 2002 song, I Want a Man Like Putin, um, <laughs> which will come up briefly in this presentation. So I want to argue that there are three masculinities he's trying to achieve. One is this uh, heroic masculinity. The warrior who flies into Chechnya in um, a uh, fighter plane. He has appeared in military uniforms. Then there's a, um, and also, Putin as the, um, this is a picture of Putin in the same pose as the last czar, Nicholas II. Um, he also, another heroic moment, flew in in 2010 to help put out fires. Um, then there's the tough masculinity. Um, this is a, a joke, this is a meme, there were a lot of memes. Um, in, in the famous phrase, uh, um, we'll catch the Chechens wherever they are, if they're in the outhouse, we'll, um, we'll rub them out in the outhouse. And this is a joke, uh, but with his characteristic uh, aggressive uh, face, and another side of you know the tough masculinity as Putin on a Harley Davidson, in, also in 2010, and then um, most recently, and I think this is very interesting, also in 2010, an attempt at a glamour masculinity, which is doing some really good work. He was singing Blueberry Hill, um, and um, I've looked very closely at these photos. I know nothing about clothes and sartorial stuff, but this is a very, very fancy and expensive suit. Um, men's suits are, you know, anyway. Um, so I just want to quickly, uh, this was the 2007, uh, 2008 uh, discussion of Become a Man Like Putin. Um, and this was the song in 2002, I Want a Man Like Putin, uh, sung by um, a girl band. And it was formed by a, somebody close to the government who said we need an agit brigade, brigade Soviet style. My boyfriend is in trouble again. He got into a fight and got stoned. I'm so sick of him. I got kicked him out. And now I want someone like Putin. Full of energy, doesn't drink, wouldn't hurt me, wouldn't run away. The song is um, pop. So it's a, it's a pop celebrity of, of Putin. Um, when people started protesting, uh, actually before the 2011 protests, much of it was focused on Putin. Now, this is normal politics, right? Anybody who's been to a protest movement, whether it was Reagan or George Bush, or you know, it, you, we personify the uh, uh, person. Um, but this begins a movement. Um, Putin should retire. Putin um, was a website. Um, they, they issued an anti-Putin manifesto. We state that the socio-political construction that is killing Russia and has now bound the citizens of our country has one architect, one custodian, and one guardian. His name is Vladimir Putin. We declare that no essential reforms can be carried out in Russia today as long as Putin controls real power. Ridding ourselves of Putinism is the first obligatory step on the path to a new Russia. So, all right, so attack on Putin. The regime in the summer of 2011 makes a number, summer and fall, especially 2011, makes a number of mistakes, um, I think. Um, the first is they create this campaign, I will rip my shirt for Putin. Two slides, because this is so, you know, you can see um, she, uh, they were going to have an army of Putin. Um, they're, 
it, it, I think part of it was they had run out of, in 2007, 2009, they show them on vacation in a horseback, and now they need a new form, so they think, oh, we'll try this. And this comes up in the protest, this is why I have to show it to you. And then the, big, the next big mistake was in 2000, August of 2011, Putin emerges from the water with two amphora um, that he had allegedly found on the bottom of the uh, Black Sea. And then in October, his press, Secretary Dmitry Peskov admitted that the four amphora uh, seizure findings were staged. So what's, why were they starting? I think my guess is that they were getting a little bit cocky. They thought as they headed into the uh, December 2011 elections that they were going to be fine. Um, uh, but then the really big mistake came in, oh, this is one of the jokes about it, Putin pulling power from an amphora. Um, so, uh, Yulkin is an amazing uh, car caricaturist. They then held the big uh, United Russia um, Party uh, the discussion on the 24th of September and said that Putin and Medvedev were going to trade places. This became known as castling, which is a, some kind of obscure chess move that if you play chess, you know. Um, but what, what's important about it is that Medvedev then says that he had known for a long time that they were going to switch places. Uh, he doesn't say exactly that way, but it, we had known for a long time. And the problem with this is it completely pulls the rug out of the notion of politics. If the top leaders know and are planning in advance what's going to happen, where's politics? Where are we? Who are we? And the sense among Russian viewers was uh, one of deep humiliation and um, embarrassment and frustration. How can they be deciding it all in advance. Um, in addition, there was a feeling that politics becomes boring. You know, if he's going to be elected not only for the next four years, but for the next six years, a move that had been just been brought in recently, and then another six years after that, will we ever get any uh, real, real politics? So then we get satire on that subject. This is Putin and Medvedev on the same occasion. Then we get castling. It's hard to see, but on the top, Medvedev's on one side and Putin's on the other. And then on the next, two days later, we, they just switch places. So, you know, what, what good is that? Um, this is magic. Putin gives rise to more Putins. Um, magic becomes a also a lot of jokes about magic. Now we get the sexualization of it all. Uh, Putin and Medvedev, now I'll be on top. Right? Sexual um, and uh, the whole question of uh, who's the dominant uh, figure. Um, that fall, we begin to have a series of protests. Um, the, one, the first one that criticizes him for his masculinity, Putin tried to appear at a prize fight, a mixed, mixed martial arts prize fight, um, and he's booed in the amphitheaters. And I would argue, and I don't have time to really help this, but this is the beginning, the first failure of Putin's tough working class masculinity is machismo, um, when people begin to say, I, we can't speak out, we can't talk about this. And then um, they also begin to criticize the whole notion of PR all the time, all the, everywhere. Um, they, the, the regime tries to run a, um, a little focus group, Putin as the father of the nation, and who's going to vote for Putin? And 90% of the respondents say, uh, we're voting for the other guy. You know that we're not voting for Putin. Um, this, they hearken back to these 2006 photos of Putin kissing um, a child. So that's another myth that begins to get questioned for Putin as the, as the um, uh, father of the nation. But the one I really want to um, look at is this notion. Can I run that silently? Uh, with them. you know, can you do that for me? Um, it's got a minute of advertising at the front, but with um, Kiki's help, I think I can do this. Um, so we then get three songs that I think are really, really interesting. Um, the first is called "Putin is Coming to Us in Kaluyova." The second one is called "Our Madhouse is Voting for Putin," and the third one is "I Want a Man." I am a man like Putin. Um, <laughs> And what they do is they revive an older Soviet era of bard singing that is done, I'm just going to play two seconds of this so you can hear the gravelly voice, that is done with a gravelly voice in the kitchen among friends. Um, so that there's a, a male um, anti-PR, and, and the commentary on these songs by the singers um, shows it. So if we plug this in, I'll play just like 
Just enough to give you a taste of it. I think it's what it's got. Oh, yeah, no, beauty. And the, the people are painting the grass green and the sky blue. The United Russia pe me party members are fighting to greet Putin and give him bread and salt. Um, and so what it is, is it's a, it's a critique of the beta masculine the sycophancy of, of people themselves. But it's also, then he says, we're either beating our heads against the wall or the other way around. And Putin is coming to Kaluyova. So there's a sense of uh, this Soviet-style uh, rejection. Um, of, uh, and, he, and he says, we've already been told who's going to be president. It's not about Putin, it's about the feeling that even the last crumbs of our right to vote are being taken away from us. In the next one, yeah, not, uh, our, our madhouse is voting for Putin, which was made by a group called Rabfak, which is also has Soviet overtones of the workers' study university. Go to the next one, it's got the... Um, in this one, um, <laughs> This morning, uh, the, the words are, this morning I asked our doctor on route. So the, the uh, uh, I don't know if we should play it. The, the idea of it is that it's taking place in a nut house. This morning I asked our doctor on rounds why we don't have the key to our unit, why there's a hole in our head and in our budget, why instead of tomorrow we have yesterday. Let the doctor tell us about oil and gas. Who sold them to the assholes? What a mess. Who stole Gazprom and Luke Oil, Russian companies, from the people? There's no answer, and it's a shot in the ass. So everything's so complicated, everything's so messed up. It's like Putin, it has Putin in it. But we're not, we don't have any time to sort it out. Our nuthouse is voting for Putin. Our nuthouse is glad of Putin. So he said, and then what's interesting is the composer said, the song is not about Putin. He said, the hero of the song is a sarcastic 50-year-old man who was born under Soviet power, absorbed all the miracles of Soviet propaganda, and lived through the 90s. He's found himself completely outside of contemporary life. He doesn't, you know, it, He's outside what we call the age of modernization. He has a strange kasha in his head. And then here's what he says. He says again, the song isn't really about Putin. We know practically nothing about Putin except what we saw on television. Here stands a familiar figure with two amphoras. Here's a first familiar figure flying. At the same time, we see some kind of PR. This song is a reaction to the PR. The PR is becoming extremely different from what we saw, or we see around us. That's why we have a sensation of schizophrenia, which is also a Soviet um, trope. That's where our nuthouse comes from. Um, a person who sees all this starts to have questions that no one's answering, and they give him a shot in the ass. That's the whole meaning of our song. And then the last one I'm going to do, and before I get the tarantulas on the table, is um, the paratroopers have a song saying, uh, I am someone just like you, which completely uh, takes up a different, yet a different masculinity. I don't think this one is so much Soviet, although actually there's lots, it's not the Soviet bard, it's the Soviet uh, uh, elite uh, army masculinity. These are, these are the elite troops. Um, and they sing, if you're a citizen, if you're a president, there's a law for you. There are forbidden acts. Don't steal money from the treasury. Never lie. Be open to all. Keep your word. You've been president for eight years and now candidate again. Look us in the eye. Um, I, uh, I, would, well, I would like to trust you, but you've lied for many years. And then the, the refrain is, you're no different from me. You are like me. Um, a person and not a god. I'm no different from you. So the original song was Putin. I want someone like Putin. And they're saying, I am someone like you. And you are someone like me. Um, you're no different from me, a person not a god. And I am someone like you, a person and not some hick. We won't let you keep lying. 
And then they say, we are the paratroopers, these elite troops of liberty, the motherland is with us. Um, so they take this um, informal style to uh, talk about that. Am I out of time? Another minute, okay. Um, so I could also show you a lot of slides, but I'm not going to, of the different um, protest uh, um, placards um, and posters, which were handmade, which is a criticism again of, uh, of the thing, but they also have a lot of sexual innuendo. So there's one that says, we know you want a third time, but I have a headache, <laughs> right? Um, Putin himself said of the um, it, protesters who were wearing white armbands to symbolize their uh, both their pacifism and their that there was, this was a new kind of colored revolution as they had in Eastern Europe. Putin said, frankly, when I looked at the television screen and saw something hanging from someone's chest, honestly, it's indecent. This is Putin. But I decided it was propaganda to fight AIDS, and that they had hung up, pardon, a condom. Right. So I, I have to. Let me just quickly go through all of these and show you my favorites. They blew us all up. The, it's a, like a condom-like, uh, which means um, they deceived us, right? And then a series of um, posters against Putin that show him with condoms. Um, this is a joke of Putin as a condom. Payekhali, uh, let's go, was a famous phrase by Yuri Gagarin when, before he took off into outer space. So it's like, can we get Putin out of here? Can we get rid of Putin um, and uh, form? And then, um, happy new year, dear friends. Um, wearing, <laughs> Putin, uh, wearing the condom. Um, who lost their little ribbon? <laughs> Warning, do not reuse <laughs> and the condom and uh, the same thing. So, um, that's a different story. But, um, so we can end here, but what, so what, what is my argument? I want to say that this um, choice of the Putin administration to rely on masculinity as uh, sort of ersatz ideology is, has been very costly to the regime. It's the same mistake that Tsar Nicholas II made, thinking that he could be close to the people and be the Tsar at the same time. Um, it, what it, what it, the problem is that uh, this kind of masculinity has to be constantly repeated, constantly demonstrated, um, and it's, it's wide open to uh, criticism. When he first brought it in, it seemed to indicate that he was more authentic, he was not fake like Gorbachev, whose language was too messed up or too complicated. It was not fake like Yeltsin in his later days pretending to, to disco. This was a real man, uh, Putin. But the problem is then, when it begins to be so clearly performed, no one believes in it. And then people begin to say, wait a minute, we're going back to our Soviet ways of uh, at least that was authentic. That was in the kitchen. That was for ourselves. So, sorry for very complicated thing. <laughs>